We are moving on to our next bit of programming here, which is our tongue twister of a title, Making Music Making Work for Working Musicians. Hello? Can you still hear me? Not hearing me. Okay. Testing. One, two, Testing. And there we go. Thank you. Yeah. Jennifer. Hi, so we're moving on to our next panel, our tongue twister of a title, Making Music Making Work for Working Musicians. That's how it does it, yes. Most people would agree that creativity has value, but putting a number on that value isn't easy, particularly in a competitive, super-saturated digital environment. But it's not all just downloads and streams. Artist compensation extends to the world of label concerns and investment in music as a whole. Today, we're looking at evolving expectations for musicians, as well as some very real issues that are impacting creators across the board. To moderate our panel is, is Kristen Thompson, FMC's co-director of our Artist Revenue Streams Project and uh, board member. <laughs> hey, everybody, how are you? Um, so I'm really uh, super excited about this panel, not only because I've been working on the Artist Revenue Streams Research Project for the past couple of years, but also because this is such a uh, an issue for me that's so interesting, the fact that musicians are now navigating a landscape that requires them, in a sense, to consider and investigate and benefit from, or not, from a variety of revenue streams. And we're talking about a, a, a pretty big shift from one from a recent past where revenue stream was fairly predictable into sort of three big buckets. There was some that was based on your performance, some on if you were a composer, what you could make from your compositions, and if you were a recording artist, you maybe made some money selling records. Now we see with streaming and webcasting and uh, fan-based funding and branding that there are so many more options. And um, I think it's really instructive for, for people to hear about how it's working for various artists, and that's why we're just so thrilled to have a diverse range of musicians and music advocates as part of the conversation today. So um, I'm going to do real quick introductions um, to our panelists, and then we're going to get into it. So uh, over on the left is Jennifer Mondi. Um, Jennifer is a vi violist for the National Symphony Orchestra. She's been with the NSO since 1995 and currently serves as the orchestra committee chair, and she's also an AF of M member. So she's a performer who doesn't compose. Then to her left is Benji Rogers. Benji is the co-founder, or the fa one of the founders and the CEO of Pledge Music. Pledge is a service that um, helps artists and bands design tailored fundraising campaigns to raise money for their next release. And in an earlier, you know, Benji's also been a musician, um, toured around, and I think provides some great perspective on some of the questions about how, how artists' projects are now funded. To his left is Chris Ruin. Chris is the author of a new book that's just come out called Freeloading, How Our Insatiable Appetite for Free Content Starves Creativity. And Chris is also a journalist based in Brooklyn and a writer and, I, could I say, a dormant musician? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, okay. sure, you could say that. All yeah, right, dormant. So dormant. All right. Like a volcano. <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 <laughs> to his left is Rodney Wittenberg, uh, the owner of Melody Vision and an Emmy-winning composer for film and TV. And Rodney is a composer, a videographer, studio producer, a musician himself, and a teacher, and an active member of the Recording Academy. And online, uh, not visible, but we can hear him, is Ben Wyman. And Ben is the uh, lead guitarist and a founding member of the band Dillinger Escape Plan. And Ben is um, uh, in Orange County, California, recording right now. And he'll be joining us to talk. Can you hear us, Ben? Yes. Sounds Yay. Good. Awesome. So <laughs> here we go. So I wanted to start with, with Benji, actually, because um, probably the, one of the beginning phases of the creative process is actually figuring out how your work is going to be funded. And um, how is Pledge Music changing the artist development s strategy? Because in prior years, it was get a big deal or maybe, you know, tour until you had enough money to put out a record. What does it look like now? Um, in some sense, it's not a huge amount has changed. Uh, people still do want to go get record deals. A lot of artists, if they were, you know, offered a giant, juicy check record deal, they would, I think the majority of them would take it. There's no getting around that. Um, the flip side to that is just that um, 
we run campaigns that help artists basically de-risk or put into profit their albums as they're being made or even in most cases before they're being made. So uh, on the smaller independent level, you can de-risk what you were going to do anyway by not having to borrow as much money or you know do that. If you're a label, you can run a campaign that would basically start while you're making the album, not just when it's finished. And the fans get to participate in that and they buy in early to you know, go along for the ride. Uh, one of the reasons that it's so been so successful is because ultimately what artists do in the studio is quite fascinating to their fans. It's just never seen. And if it is seen, it's shared willy-nilly on social networks, which is very hard to monetize if there's no way to actually buy it at that moment. We just created a way to buy it at that moment, be a part of its journey. And, you know, one of the biggest records we did this year was essentially in profit after about six hours from one Facebook post and one tweet. Whereas otherwise they would have had to dig themselves out of debt for the first few months to try and get to that same phase. So it's just been, I've been obsessed by elongating the way in which albums are released. Not just, you know, if you're in the studio, you're doing something interesting that a fan could be watching. And if there's no ability to buy that moment or experience, then there's just no ability to buy it. So a lot of, you know, I think that the, the, the changing message is that not everyone can get, have their record be profitable. But that three, four, five thousand dollars you were going to spend or borrow or go into debt for no longer is necessary to do. Fans want to be a part of the conversation. Social networks have shown us that. Uh, fans have just never been given a way to be able to, you know. And I was describing it, there was a manager we worked with, and I said, I saw your tweet, your band's in the studio. I'd like to give you $200. Where do I pay? I want to give it to you right now. Here's my card. And he's like, the album's not out till September. And it was, this was in, in March. And I was like, yeah, I know, but you're in the studio. You're doing something. This is exciting. I want to, come on, let me go. And that was when it was like, oh, you're right. You can't pay me for this. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. And I'm going to give all, this, all of this content away for free to everybody and create a generalized consumer experience. And what I should really be focusing on is a fan experience for the people like me who want to spend more but don't have the ability to nine times out of ten until a few moments before the release comes out in the cycle of what a musician does. So help people think about how you're different from things like Kickstarter where, I, you know, at least as I perceive it, it's like we get the money to, from our fans to support the project, but then it kind of, the, the Kickstarter um, support structure kind of ends there after you've done, you know, sent out all your, yeah. your promised deliverables. So how does Pledge kind of extend through the recording release phase? Sure. The, the general crowdfunding is basically give me money in the next 30 days and I'll go do something. And there's nothing wrong with that. But again, it's still missing the sort of point, which is that I don't necessarily want to fund anyone's album. I want to watch something happen. So at the 30 days, once the money's in, is kind of when it should begin, not end. And so we just extended the way in which albums come out to say, Pledge you to be a part of our album. You know, the records that we're launching today are going to come out in April or Mar you know, March, April, May of next year. Our most successful campaign to date actually was 11 months long and it ended up in the top 10 in the UK in the midweeks because ultimately fans were taken along on the journey to make a triple album on CD, vinyl, and DVD. <laughs> like, you know, it's, and this is something that would not have been commercially viable in any other way. So I think really what it's about is it's just fans are often bored at a job they don't like, there's not much to do, and showing them pictures of what they could be a part of and showing them videos and teasers with an inability to actually do anything with other than just kind of say, I'm looking at it, like it, comment on it, shouldn't that be an ability for me to get involved? That way I'm in, and all you gotta do is let me know what's happening and when it's gonna arrive. You know, I'm the kind of person that if I see it, I'm like, okay, I want a signed test pressing, I want signed vinyl, I want a handwritten lyric sheet or a poster, that's about 200 bucks. Let me just do it at that moment. Because the reality of it is, is that by waiting and just doing pre-orders on iTunes or Amazon, you're just giving iTunes and Amazon all of your customer data. They're taking 30% for holding a file and a picture. And again, that's nothing wrong with that, that's just how it is. Uh, but you don't own that. You can't then tell those same fans about your shows. You can't then reach out to them when your next release is coming out. Um, they may have all your previous catalog on there, but that's not going to help you move mm -hmm. the next part forward. So I think it's just about opening up a conversation with fans. It doesn't have to be, you know, this is me getting out of the shower, this is me doing everything, or this is what <laughs> I'm eating. But it can be, 
here's an unreleased demo. Here's the mixed version. Here's the mastered version. Now it's in your hands. And by the way, the first 3,000 people to get involved get their name in the album credits. You, it's just multiple points of contact. So in one sense, what a crowdfunding campaign does is we've got 30 days to do something, then it's over. What a record release strategy is, is pre-order my album, buy my album, have you bought my album? Mm -hmm. There are three mm -hmm. moments for you to really communicate. And once those are over, you're kind of like, hey, have you bought my album yet? Hey, guys, my album's out. Have you bought it? And it becomes that kind of painful moment for a lot of indie artists and me personally have felt where it's like, how much more can I try and sell these guys the same thing? Whereas if you unfold a release process into 20, 30, 40 pieces of you know, stuff that's happening, then I've got 30, 40 times to get involved. If I don't want it, I can just wait for it to come out and you know, yeah, show you. That's good. Talk for hours, sorry. Yeah, I mean, we could talk a lot about this new process of artist development and, and funding, but I also wanted to bring Ben into the conversation because um, w I think it's fair to say that Dillinger Escape Plan makes most of its money from live performance and touring, right, Ben? Um, that's partly true. I think um, that, that is a good part of it, but I think, you know, number one, you have to have a good market to invest in. So having good music and being a real band that has a solid foundation is, is number one. Once you have that, you can really... And so, um, you know, things like, I think, Pledge is amazing. Um, you know, but just being a solid band that can play in any market all over the world is really important. Um, and, uh, it, yeah, I mean, it, it's really hard to say. I, I've been making money in so many different ways just based off the, the career that I've built so far. So, um, you know, for, for us, it's we haven't really been that greatly affected by the downfall of, of uh, physical music sales because we've always kind of functioned um, in a way that enabled us to, to just make money in any way possible. So um, what are some other ways that, that the band and you make money? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get that. So what are some other ways that, that Dillinger makes money and you yourself? What, have you, what else have you done sure. or what else can you count on? Well, the merch thing is great. Touring and merch is great, and uh, you and I have talked about this in the past. But we've we've started doing we a lot of limited edition merchandise, which is similar to, to uh, kind of the philosophy that Benji was talking about with Pledge, where you know we try to connect and create real value for our fans. And um, one of the ways we do that is by every time we put out a record, we release a series of limited edition T-shirts. Um, we make a t-shirt for every single song on the record and we're able to spread that out pretty much over an entire um, record cycle until the next record comes out so we're constantly putting things out there um, and we're able to really really limit our costs on things like that because we can have them up there while we're touring we can have them up there when we're not touring and the we have shirts that are made so people really want all of them so um, I'd say an average Dillinger fan probably spends at least a hundred dollars a year on us. And when you think about that, if you have things out there, whether it's tickets or T-shirts or, or or bundles and packages, a hundred dollars a year is not hard. And ten, twenty thousand fans to reach is really not that big of an obstacle when you think about it. If you're out there and you're active, and that's you know, that's a couple million dollars. So it's really. Um, I, the key is is really just being very frugal and not having a million people getting their hands in that pot, and that's really the that's really the question. <laughs> that's really the tricky part because obviously you know, as a band that's active and writing music and touring, you can't do everything yourselves. But that's really been the balance that we've been getting better at throughout the years and, and seem to have a handle on pretty well. Yeah, definitely. I'll come back to you in a second. I wanted to um, ask Rodney since. Um, <laughs> Um, I've had other conversations with Rodney over the years because we both live in Philadelphia and are, uh, we're part of the Recording Academy pr um, board together. Um, I know you wear a lot of musical hats. And what Ben was just saying rings true. I mean, he has, they have a lot of stuff going on. He himself has even more going on, producing records and all that stuff. Tell me why you wear so many musical hats. Uh, because it's the model that I found to be able to make a living. Mm -hmm. um, it's if there's not enough composing gigs, I know that I can. I'll get a producing gig. If, in, in, for example, right now I have too many gigs, but it's good, and I'm working through all the things I have to do. 
because who knows in January maybe there won't be any gigs mm -hmm. you know so that's one of the reasons why I wear a lot of hats the other reason is because I love it mm -hmm. I mean I love uh, I wanted uh, I made the decision when I was uh, when I stopped playing in a band when I was about 25 or 26 that I wanted to continue having a creative life mm -hmm. and I wanted what I wanted to be able to wake up every morning and do something that was immensely creative that related to music in some way and that would make some money for me <laughs> so what I find most interesting about mm -hmm. some of your work mm -hmm. is the com composing for film and TV work mm -hmm. because we oftentimes think about music and money and stuff like that as being dependent on sound recordings and playing shows and merchandise. You know, those are three big things that people can re sort of relate to when they're thinking about how musicians make money. But when you're composing for film and TV, different story, right? Mm -hmm. And so how has, how has that, um, I don't want to, it's going to take too long to d describe how it typically, typically operates, but how has it changed over the past 10 well, years? <laughs> One of the, s I, I was thinking of when I was sitting out there, I was thinking of about, uh, when I started doing this about 20 years ago, uh, I went on informational interviews and I went and met with a number of other composers. And one of them said to me, and I'll never forget this, he goes, I said, well, you know, I'm young, I'd love to do some work for you. Do you have any extra work? I'd love to do it. He looked at me and goes, no, I don't have any extra work. I take all the work that comes in and actually I hope you fail. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. He's since, I see him all the time. I've hooked him up with some gigs actually. and he got, he got, <laughs> He always gives me a little look or something. But um, but I'm thinking about the fact that there's so much competition, there's so much music, and it's so devalued. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that is going on now in how media acquires music is crowdsourcing. And I think that's fine because it gives everybody an opportunity, but the problem is it devalues the, the work. I mean, um, something that I would have gotten paid, let's say, $2,000 10 years ago, there's someone now who'll do it for 50 bucks or 100 bucks. Um, or if a company knows that they can license a piece of music for $100, why would they hire me to compose it? It's actually easier for them to just download it from some website and pay 50 or 100 bucks for it and stick it in their media than it is to have the relationship with the composer and figure out what that music's going to be. Now, it's debatable what music works better, but if they're only thinking of it as something that's there to do a job and not to more than that if it's just a utility what difference does it make for them and how how much you know if they can save money and get it for cheap that they're fine doing that and that's a challenge the other thing is um there's just so much competition mm -hmm. there uh, when you think about it i i said and think because i also teach at uh, a couple of universities every year just in the city of philadelphia there are thousands of musicians that graduate and there's no place for them to go to get a job there's nobody hiring hey we need musicians here they all are basically small businesses each and every one of them has to go out and find something some way of making a living whether it's busking or writing music for something or trying playing music or but there's only so many jobs out there so it's it it's it's it, it, it there's a continued devaluation of the value of of what the consumer or what someone who's producing media will pay mm -hmm. for uh, someone to create or license music. And I, and I, I think the one of the things that's been most depressing to me this year, and I will pick on someone, <laughs> but uh, there's a new movie that Rob Burnett, who is with Worldwide Pants, put out, and he was, I mean, it was really depressing to me, but he was very excited about it. He was on all these different talk shows, uh, Morning Show and The Day Show, talking about how he got the entire soundtrack for free. Mm -hmm the entire soundtrack to his film, he didn't pay a penny for. And he was saying, this is the future model for making movies. You can all get your music for free because they used Red Bull Live or something like that and they got all these bands to say they put their music in the film and they ended up with 20, something like 22 songs in there. And I, you know, that's fine, it's, you know, but what does that say to the next person who comes along who's making a film or TV show? Oh yeah, music budget, zero. We'll get all that stuff for free, you know, and that's, well, I wanna Thank you, Rodney. I wanted to move to Chris because I know he's written a book that pretty much touches on the value of music yeah. in the consumer aspect of it. And so tell us how you got to writing freeloading and, you know, what your perspective is and take on this is. It was a really bad idea, <laughs> but um, I don't have good judgment. No, anyway, so uh, I just, I, I wanted to add a new perspective to the debate as I saw it. And um, I'm 31. Uh, I was a freshman in college in the year 2000, and uh, when Napster was at its peak, I pirated tons of music. My friends all pirated tons of music. Um, actually, part of the book is 
I think freeloading is a better word for piracy or for file sharing, but I'm not going to stuff anything down people's throats. Um, but anyway, Emily White's piece I actually really identified with because that was really my experience uh, when I was that age. And when I, my wife works with kids in college and high school, and I was having a conversation with one of them recently, and same deal, you know, I, I was telling him what the book was about, and he's like, oh yeah, we, I don't, I never pay for music, none of my friends ever pay for music, you know, it's just, it's not even a, it's not even a debate, you know, it's not really much of an issue, but anyway, um, I'll spare you some of the details, but over time, uh, I was a music journalist, I wrote for the New York Press, and I did some writing for Tiny Mixtapes as well, um, I grew pretty disturbed with what I was seeing, and I, I guess the big change in my perspective was when um, I live in Brooklyn and there were a lot of bands that I was kind of getting to know who were getting lots of press and, um, you know, two years before when I was in college, I would have thought, hey, this, these, are, these guys are making it. These are like, this is pretty impressive. This is the, if you're a musician, this is the goal. And at the time I was in the service industry, I was working as a barista and I realized I like went to their apartments and I realized that actually I seemed to be making about the same amount of money as they were and I was working like 25 hours a week at a coffee shop so that was a big wake-up call and it wasn't to say that any artist deserves a certain amount of money but rather what is the argument um, for not giving these working musicians just a reasonable level of respect uh, and acknowledge their rights because I think this was presented in the context of Metallica in terms of a rich versus poor argument and that just completely broke down for me so I reevaluated things and um, started writing about it and tried to put consumers and who I viewed as my peers on the spot for the practice of piracy and I got not a not so surprising reaction which was a lot of anger and vitriol tossed my way and I was trying to confront people so you know I, it was expected but the surprising thing is that I got a lot of positive reaction and probably about 80 percent of the reaction was, came in the form of thank yous and um, and also a lot of conflicted emotion. I got the sense that there was this huge middle ground out there that just wasn't being addressed and wasn't uh, finding a voice in the debate. Um, and then, you know, as I went on uh, researching the book, I talked to lots of different musicians and people in the independent music scene. Um, I just came to realize how much dysfunction um, has, has been embedded into this debate since 2000. And, uh, and that's what the book's about. But in terms of this, you know, particular panel, I would just make the comment that, you know, we, revenues are important, but I think the core of this issue comes down to rights and consent and whether or not we can check ourselves and understand that there's something uh, important about respecting the rights of artists. And I think until we kind of figure out a way to talk about that, we're sort of wasting our time. Um, and at the same time, we're selling ourselves short as a creative culture. And obviously that means less potential for artists making money, which is the subject of this panel. But I think it also uh, makes it less likely that services like Pandora or Spotify or any legitimate digital service is going to make money. Because what is this illegitimate market doing but seeping demand from uh, what would be going into the legitimate market? So, um, but, you know, I, I think basically in general we need to look for how can we achieve basic fairness from the marketplace um, how can we respect the rights of creators, but at the same time, how can we respect the rights of the public? And I think both of those have to be involved in the equation going forward. That's great. Thank you. So speaking of uh, a different sort of way that artists are compensated and culture is, you know, culture is involved with music is what Jennifer does as a salaried player with the National Symphony Orchestra. And so, you know, I know we could spend an entire day talking about the current challenges with orchest orchestras, with a lot of turmoil right recently with contract disputes. Um, uh, but I do hope we can talk a bit about how the NSO is changing from the player's perspective, whether you're playing, where you're, whether you're traveling more, whether you have more um, obligations to the work, or, um, how it, maybe the NSO has diversified it, its own revenue streams and whether you as a player see any benefit to that. Uh, well, that's kind of a multifaceted question. Yeah, obviously. there's a lot there. Um, it, it used to be way back in the old days when this was, when playing in an orchestra for a salary was, was a brand new experience. Um, it, it grew from being, you, you rehearse at night and you do what you can, you have one or two rehearsal or concerts that week or that month that was the beginning of a professional orchestra to where we have a different program every week. We play for the most part in the same place all the time 
we have our locker rooms, we have everything all, you know, this is where we live. Um, and we try and minimize how much of our time we're on the road, partially because to drag 140 people across the world is incredibly expensive. So it's not like just bringing a band and playing a gig and moving on. It, it's a logistical nightmare with a whole commercial flight full of people. Um, however, you know, kind of the last 10 years, I think we'll look back on as the new good old days <laughs> where, where we could do that. And we, we did go on tours, but the musicians forcibly limited the amount of time we could go on tour because it's just exhausting and we don't want to do it. We didn't think our managements needed to do that to make us profitable. Now we see a lot more outside venues. I've played in a lot more um, high school theaters than I'd really like to just because it's not conducive really to what we do, but we do the best we can. Um, there's a lot more outreach concerts. There's a lot more. We run out to one town in the middle of Pennsylvania where they're willing to pay our fee for some fundraiser gala that they have to have us there and play what we they tell us to. Um, so those things are creeping back in. It 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 kind of got to an apex where we were mostly where we wanted to be all the time, and now things are are going back to where we're kind of farming ourselves out. And I would like to say that we have a lot more product to put out there, but uh, the orchestra, again, the orchestra is very expensive, and to have 100 people get paid to make a recording just doesn't happen very much anymore. There are lots of ways that they've made it much more streamlined. And mostly, it tends to be live recordings of concerts now, which is a totally different rate than setting us up for four hours with all these mics and all this stuff, and everyone has to be silent for another 20 seconds after the, the final chord ends and have a traditional um, recording session that doesn't happen very often except for movies and film, that type of thing. Um, but even even the, the cheaper options that they have are not, they feel are not marketable, which I think is a huge shame because I think they don't give us enough credit. There's only, to have 100 people on stage doing the same thing at the same time is an incredibly powerful and effective medium and I, there's nothing like it. Mm -hmm. So why anybody thinks that that can be duplicated in any other way, I, I don't know. And I really wish that our managers would have a lot more confidence in, in our value. But mm. I continue to pester them on a daily basis about having that confidence. Trust me, they're not real happy about that. Did I miss any that, Well, topics? that covers a lot of it. And um, I, uh, just to sort of, uh, sort of probe a bit, um, does, does NSO do things like, I don't know, sell t-shirts or sell recordings in a in a gift shop afterwards? Yeah, I mean, is there have, anything? <laughs> I just we wondered. have two gift shops in the Kennedy Center. Uh -huh. I have never found an NSO t-shirt in any of them. Again, I'm in people's faces about this all the time. Maybe if I stopped, they'd put Tote a t-shirt in. Tote, Tote bag. <laughs> Actually, when we go on tour, we have this residency, well, we used to have this residency program where we go to a different state every year, Montana, Louisiana, that type of thing. And the people that were supporting us in that state would give us tote bags that said the National Symphony on it. But <laughs> us giving them, not so much. We, we do have merchandise. And again, in, in the Kennedy Center, two gift shops. There is not one NSO recording. I was just looking there with my son to bring a present to a friend. There's no recordings. Really? Come on. Um, so what can I say? Wow. We. It, I think we should have that stuff. All right. Well, um, I wanted to ask Ben about merchandise because you touched on a little bit with your exclusive T-shirts. But something else that I remember you telling me when we had a conversation earlier is how diligent you are with <laughs> inventory and also just also how you deal with keeping tour. I mean, tour expenses under check because, yeah, sure, gross tour numbers can sometimes be enormous. You know, really big. <laughs> but unless the band yeah. and the artist is actually controlling costs, it doesn't matter, right? So can you tell us a bit about how you run your touring band? Yeah, well, uh, we've been lucky enough to survive this long where we've been able to make every mistake possible and learn from it. Um, and, and a lot of that is luck. And a lot of that is, is uh, just at this age, I really can't go back and uh, get it any other job. So <laughs> you got to make it work. And um, that's a big part of it, just making it work. I always say you got to play jazz with your career. You can't make an exact. Uh, you can't have an exact idea of how you want things to go, or how you're going to do things, or how you're going to make every dollar, or where you're going to go exactly with your career. You just got to keep going, and as things come at you, you've got to jam with it and just like make it work. And so, um, one of the things that we realized very early on is that um, 
sometimes eliminating the clutter of management and lawyers and all that stuff can actually save you money um, because the reality is is that people want their products out there. If it's a bus, if it's lights, if it's sitting in a warehouse, they'd rather get something than nothing for it. And when, we know, and when they know it's not so, a, a check from a major label or somebody like that coming through, they're going to work with you. So we've been very um, frugal throughout the years and just trying to not um, really limit our, our, our uh, stage show or, um, or anything like that but still present a professional scenario. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's just been a matter of really just doing that, looking, taking the time, caring about your, your final product and, and, and going for it as opposed to just saying, ah, we can't do that, that's too expensive or that's for bigger bands. Um, you'd be surprised when you get, you'd be surprised what you get when you ask. <laughs> All right, cool. So Benji, how do, peop, how do bands that have gone through the pledge system leverage their, yeah. um, their pre pledge activity to do, do shows, merchandise, whatever? Well, one of the things I was going to say is it's interesting because um, in a digital age where people are streaming more and, and torrenting or, or hard drive swapping, whatever it is, 82% of pledgers buy something physical and mm. only 18% wow. buy something digital only. Um, they, I've seen people buy, re buy records that don't have record players. They want uh, a, a, like a, a sign that they were part of it more than they want the actual music itself and the really funny thing is is that sometimes only 50 percent of people will download the actual album that they've bought though they'd rather have something that was they were there as it was happening the other thing that we do is is that we start off with a set number of exclusive items on there so we'll start with s digital digital plus cd signed cd t-shirt bundle poster and then as it moves along if it reaches a certain threshold we'll add vinyl then mm -hmm. we'll add sign vinyl, then we'll add test pressings, mm -hmm. then we'll add artwork. So the entire thing is dynamic and it changes as you want it. The reason being there is simply because if you know how much you have to manufacture, six months before you have to manufacture it, you can source it different places, you can get the best deals. And um, the other thing is, is that a lot of times we work with labels now where they'll say, you guys take care of the record and whatever you make will match in marketing funds. Mm -hmm. They want because the labels want to de-risk their business as well. So ultimately, if you can come to the table saying, "Right, we we need to make uh, we were going to make 500 vinyl. We're actually going to make a thousand because we sold enough to make that margin." Having that data before you you're going to manufacture is really your strongest bargaining position because when you're on the road, you know exactly what you've got. And the other thing is, a lot of times you'll your fans will have missed something from a previous show or tour that they want and if you've got excess stock lying around or if your label that dropped you uh you know was kind enough to give you lots of stuff back you can add that stuff for the kind of the value that it has still so you know i've got 14 extra large men's shirts from the tour 10 years ago well there might be 14 people that want that along with the new sign cd you know so it's about being smart about how you do those things i think it's absolutely right that um, a lot of times we've, we've done campaigns with major labels whereby the, art, the manager says, I want to run a pledge campaign. We're going to pre-sell all of your albums, but we want to use the money we raised to fund our tour. Mm -hmm. so you spend money on marketing, we'll, 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 we'll keep our touring expenses. Right. Because ultimately what it is is the average pledger wants to spend between $50 and $64. Mm -hmm. And they want to do that today. They don't want to do it when it's out. They want to do it today. And to not have that in the barrel ready to go just feels like it's being left on the table and also to sell that same pledger or that same fan a 999 experience or a 799 experience when they're willing to pay 50 or 60 is again just leaving money on the right. table so it's about a, it's about foreknowledge of what's coming right um good right yeah. so i want to ask two more questions and then we're going to go to the audience and gene will help us out with that but i want to ask rodney about something which is since the film and tv composition world kind of has two payment components. There's the money that you get paid for the work, but then there's the money on the back end, mm -hmm. the performance money and the, the money that stream comes through like maybe on an iTunes um, compilation of a soundtrack. So have you seen that money? Is it, could it be, f could it be better done? Um, Let's say. That's a tricky question. For most of the films I've worked on have been independent films, mm -hmm. so there haven't been the soundtracks that have been released, I've put out myself because mm -hmm. I, I got to the point where I can negotiate to keep ownership of the copyright. The challenge is, since I don't perform and I'm not out there playing, it's hard for me to 
really sell them, mm -hmm. and particularly um, on, on on independent movies where they're also trying to you know. While a movie may be on Netflix, who, I mean, I, I don't know how many people are watching it, or yeah. or how many people actually say, oh, "I saw this movie. I really want the score." You know, it's it's hard to it's hard to say. So I don't see it that way. I I, I do see good royalties mm -hmm. from things airing on TV and you know films that are uh, that have, you know that I did maybe ten years ago yep. that are still I see lying around somewhere yep. and I get a check from ASCAP. So that's cool. But the other stuff really doesn't have the the impact. Also. Um, it's hard to negotiate a deal with, uh, with the wor projects I've worked on that are released by major companies. It's hard to negotiate a deal where I'm going to get paid as the composer for uh, when they reissue something. Because usually it's a, it's a work for hire. Right. So exactly. th that revenue stream doesn't affect me. Right. Um, Chris, we talked a bit about the valuation of music and consumers' um, perspective on it. I wondered if you think musicians need to play a role in educating their own fans about how it works and how and the value of music. Yeah, I think I read this on Copy Hype, but this this line that um, before there can be a right, there must first be a wrong. And uh, I think musicians who, I mean, musicians are all over the place on this issue. It's not like there's one opinion, just like just like fans, you know, everybody has a different idea about what the problem is, if there's a problem, and then what to do about it. But I think I would just say that I, I hope that we can create increasingly an environment where musicians who do have grievances and do feel as though they're being exploited and not being offered a basic level of fairness from the marketplace or from their fans feel relatively free and comfortable and just telling people what they think because you know I think one of the most destructive elements of the past decade plus of this conversation is just the lack of artist input and I think part of that was genuine confusion and not wanting to be on the wrong side of history in one way or another, but I think the rubber is kind of meeting the road. And um, so anyway, yeah, mm -hmm. I, but I think definitely artists need to communicate how they feel about it to their fans. Mm -hmm. But I think the media and labels, I think everybody really has a role to play. Right, sure, great. So let's see if there's any questions out there. Anybody? All right, well, I have a couple more for you. Um, Was it so all-encompassing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We've solved, We've solved all, all of it. But yeah. that brings me up to, to my two questions, because I told everybody beforehand that I wanted to offer them an opportunity to think about two sort of big things. One is, um, and they can pick or they can answer both. One of them is, what is the revenue stream that has developed over the past 10 years, or even from before, that has most surprised you? Um, as an artist, maybe something you didn't expect or something that has grown beyond what you ever expected. And the second one is, if you could wave a magic wand and fix anything related to artist compensation or how it works for you in your, in your field or genre, what would you fix? So that has to be magic wand, that has to be wizardish because we know it would be impossible or I mean very difficult to do rea in reality. So, um, so let's start with Ben. So um, oh, Ben, yeah. what's the revenue stream that's most surprised you? That's a really hard question because, like I said, we've been doing this. I mean, for 20 years, I've been making music, making music, and and making money in the same exact way. I just, you know, I went from jumping into a car, into an RV, into a van, into a into a bus. That's about the only difference. <laughs> and uh, so, for me, it hasn't changed that much. The one thing that I have found interesting is that um, I've personally been able to make um, additional revenue from just the credibility of my band. And that was a surprise to me. Just right. um, staying strong and focused, and, and just never really varying from a, from our vision, has created an opportunity for for me to make music individually. Whether it be I, I just recently did a soundtrack, um, because the director was a fan of the band, and um, I uh, you know produced some things with some other artists. I just worked with that artist Kimbra, who was on that Gautier track that's really um, popular just based on the fact that she grew up listening to, to Dillinger. So that's been a big surprise for me, the fact that, that um, just the band's um, name has brought me additional work that I never expected to get. Sure. And do you want to play Wizard and um, fix something? Sorry, what? Do you, want, do you want to wave a magic wand and fix anything? Oh, do I want to make ways on it? Well, I, what I would like to see is that more technology companies spending more time on um, making, uh, stealing intellectual property harder and buying intellectual property easier as opposed to just 
creating platforms for people to just uh, kind of complain and, and try and get free music and you know <laughs> that there's a lot of the, you know I find these social networks is just kind of like a platform that promotes the idea that intellectual property should be free mm -hmm. um, as opposed to trying to help the problem really so I would like to see more of that personally Great. thank you how about you Jennifer what would you like to, what, what revenue streams have surprised you anything well uh, is there anything that you do? Well, I, I could also amend it a bit because I know you guys, there's more that you and your peers do besides just playing shows and rehearsing. Well, the, the whole point of having a contract to be a symphony orchestra member is that, that that is my primary job. That is what I'm responsible for on a daily, hourly basis. And if I choose to do nothing else, that, that is my focus, which really is the best way to be an orchestra musician, to be mm -hmm. focused at. However, teaching and doing that type of thing, playing chamber music, helps me on a personal level which makes me a more interesting person which makes me a better orchestra player so there are people that take advantage of those opportunities more or less depending on how much energy and time they have how many how few kids they have as the case may be um and that's it, it's the way that symphony orchestras kind of subsidize the entire classical music world is that, you know you have professors that would never be able to be professors for what they're getting paid from that university for their amount of work, but because it's their second job, then the, the kids have access, or pupils have access to that level of professor that they never would otherwise. Same with chamber music. I mean, you get paid nothing for chamber music for the most part, but we get the opportunity to do it for a public, which is great, not just in our living room. Um, so that none of those things surprise me, I guess. Mm -hmm. the, the one thing that actually surprises me, and our revenue stream is so hard to determine because it's mostly very large scale donors that, that give us a lot of money, is we started this project a few years ago where we have our major, major donors come and sit on stage in the middle of a rehearsal and just experience what that's like. Because I, mean, like, I don't own a stereo system because I sit on the best one ever <laughs> created. Why would I need it? And just their th enthusiasm about being there. I would have thought they'd just stick earplugs in and wait for it to be over and so they can get to the, the bar. But um, th their th enthusiasm coming out of those performances is is staggering and very humbling and um, I, I'm assuming has led to very good donations mm. because we continue to do it. Right, right. So Before we get to the wizard question, it looks like we have one from the audience. <laughs> yeah, hi, <coughs> I'm Chris. Uh, I co-founded an organization here called Listen Local First. We work with local businesses around town to sort of uh, create opportunities and alternate avenues of local exploration for local musicians. So. One thing that I'm not here, I guess I heard it a couple panels back, but maybe the artists on this panel can, can talk about is really, uh, well actually, let me start with a panel I heard last year where they talked about, uh, you know, uh, it was like sort of fair trade venues, I remember, and sort of creating a standard among local businesses, local, local venues to pay artists, you know, they, they, a fair trade venue paid an artist a certain amount, or sort of establishing, like, if you're going to use artists in your local community, you're going to pay a set amount. If you're going to pay artists for a show, you're going to pay a certain amount. If a business is going to use a track, sort of you, you set a standard. That's sort of, it's, it's kind of to a small extent what we've been doing here, but really that takes me to the building the relationships with local businesses and really finding revenue streams through either streaming through local businesses, uh, advertising for local businesses, um, doing events, sort of uh, building up the events in your uh, sort of in your individual communities to sort of build the support to bring you to the next level. Uh, I want to know what you guys uh, thought about that. Thank you. Anybody want to talk about um, the connections with local? We uh, one of the things that we do is um, I just got back from Nova Scotia, Canada, and I was speaking with you know tons of musicians up there. Um, they very much engage their local communities and the local communities completely support them. And one of the things that we do when we write campaigns for them and work with them is we say, you should, if you're going to South by Southwest and you're going to make something for them and your fans are going to help you get there, bring them something back. Return it to where it is locally. So one of my favorites is, is pledge you to be a part of our trip to South by Southwest. We'll take you along on the journey and we'll bring you back a recording live from you know, the church or, or we'll, uh, we'll, you know, every day while we're on tour, we'll record something on the tour bus for you and bring it back. Because the majority of things that happen is, is most local bands want to leave their local community <laughs> to go make more money than they can sustain there. Um, so we, we've basically, we write those into a lot of what we do simply because that's, that's the nature of what will, your homegrown fan base is the one that will expand and expand and expand if you allow them 
the the means to do so as my own point yeah chris what about brooklyn i mean obviously a hotbed of music right now do you yep. see brooklyn bands supporting each other uh, and, I think on and connecting with the yeah yeah I think so I mean I I was actually uh, the question made me think about Todd Patrick who is actually one of the people I interview in the book and he talks about this very uh, specifically about I mean sort of the argument that I'm making about this general spirit of fairness and ethics I, I think he is a I mean he's doing that in in the live realm and that's that's his focus and and um, he's been very influential in. Um, you know, trying to create spaces where, as he talks about in the book, the the fans pay less, the artist gets paid more, and the venue is still able to make a profit. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's an interesting way to think about going forward, especially with, you know, the, there's like that flip side of how successful live has been, live revenues, um, which is that all of the, a lot of these venues, you know, are owned by the same companies, and that doesn't give the musicians a whole lot of influence. Yeah, right. So I'm going to go back to my... Oh, hello. My name is Graham, and I'm actually involved with the fair trade concept that was just brought up. And I have a question for you, actually, Kristen. Me? Okay. With the, um, the research in the revenue streams, I'm wondering if it got broken down for the live performance mm -hmm. to local and f essentially foreign markets. No. Uh, we asked people uh, a number of questions about live performance, and we actually asked them separate from being a salaried player. So making that point, that distinction clear. But when we ask them about live performance, we mostly ask the very top level stuff, like how many shows do you play a year? Uh, is that number increasing or decreasing? Uh, what percentage of that, is, of that is your revenue? And we also asked about the cost side, you know, what's costing more now? Gas, airlines, travel, crew, all that stuff, but not about where they're playing. And we didn't ask that, no. Nope. Okay. Thanks. Okay, back to my uh, uh, two questions. So I'm gonna ask Benji about um, the revenue stream that's most surprised you, yeah. and if you could wave a magic wand, what you would do. The revenue stream that's most surprised me is, um, I think, house concerts and vinyl. Mm -hmm. We see those just fly. Um, uh, and as I said, you know, 82, when, I, when I asked our dev team to run the stats on the physical versus digital only sales, it was stunning. I mean, 82% is just bucking every trend possible. I think it's because true fans want to have that moment. So that's the one that surprised me. If I could ma wave a magic wand, I have a very, very specific thing that I want to make happen. And I want every streaming service, everyone, every service that streams music to allow pre-orders to exist on their platforms so that streaming services can help artists make their future recordings, not just monetize the past. Mm. Because ultimately, at the moment, every streaming service is playing something that happened already. So if you're a band and you're making your new album, you can't send anyone to Pandora, you can't send anyone to Spotify, and you can't send anyone there because there's no backward way mm -hmm. for that fan to say, you know, they'll enter your band name in, they'll say, you know, I'll just use the example, we go Ben Folds 5, and you'll see everything he's done, but not what he's doing. Mm -hmm. There's no link to the future. And so if the streaming services allow platforms like ours and others to say, there's a new album being made at this very moment, you can be a part of it, then the artist wants to push more music, more, more fans to those streaming services because they are helping in actual discovery that can lead to the future of making music, not just the past. That's great. Okay, we, I just heard that Senator Wyden is here, but I want to give you each a chance to answer one of the questions. So either wave a magic wand or make, I, I think, I know you want to wave a magic I'll wand. I'll quickly wave the magic, yeah, I'll quickly wave the wand. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just say that I, I, I wish uh, we could reform maximum copyright terms to 50 years uh, because I think that's right and in order and there's historical precedent for that. Uh, but I'd also say that it's equally important to be actually enforcing the <laughs> those rights for those works that are under term. Mm -hmm. Great. And f see, you know, looking anywhere you can for solutions. And you should ask Chris about his awesome uh, event with David Byrne soon. Yeah, New York Public Library, December 5th. Woo! Nice. Kind of crazy. Rodney, last word, my friend. Last word. Uh, what I would wave my magic wand and do is I wish there was a way to educate the general public about how actually, how much work it takes to make a recording and to write a song and to bring it to completion so that there was some sense of value, mm -hmm. that it could be valued again. I think, all, I mean, all the laws and everything are great, but there's this, you know, when I talk to my students who are young, there's a sense that it's not worth 
much. Mm -hmm. And it kills me because uh, recording or uh, someone writing music it takes years of their life to learn how to do this skill or craft, study to pl learn how to play the instrument. I think and artists have historically done a disservice. You know, they'll say, how, how long did it take to write that song? Oh, a couple minutes. You know, it really took their whole life. But they'll just say in an interview, oh, a couple minutes. I mean, uh, it, it sounds it, cool it, that way. It sounds cooler <laughs> that way. But it really gives the audience a, 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 the wrong impression about what it really takes to make something of quality, make yeah. something of good. And that's actually my, my uh, you said, uh, surprise, yeah. but actually that's my frustration because mm -hmm. I started offering to the general public, hey, have a, a songwriter or a composer write original song for your birthday or your celebration. People, it's it's such a hard concept for people to get their wrap their head around. Yeah. yeah, there are right. people that do it, but it's we have it all the time on our yeah. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. Well, this has been fantastic, and I wish we could keep carrying, keep, keep the conversation going, but uh, help me thank our panelists for being part of today's conversation. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You're awesome.